Chapter 1. Prologue Do we have souls? Are we merely lifeless automatons? Or does a ghost live in the machine? Few questions are of more significance to mankind. For years, science was content with the former view. In fact, many who confuse neuroscience with neuroscientism continue to believe they are soulless zombies that lack inner subjective experience entirely. Chapter 2. Go Mad from the Revelation Recent findings in physics have upset the tables on our conventional thinking about the world. Unsettling results have been found that would undo not the ghost, but the machine. Jaw-dropping discoveries that would horrify the most die-hard of materialists. There is no proverbial spoon, and we now have the science to prove it. In 2007, Anton Zeilinger, the famed inventor of quantum teleportation, teamed up with Marcus Aspelmeyer and experimentally falsified realism in quantum mechanics. Objects in the quantum realm do not exist prior to measurement. And if this is not enough, when taken in context of quantum non-locality, this discovery leads to an even more disturbing realization. The space in which we supposedly exist is an elaborate illusion, a conclusion shared from different angles by both string theory and the quantum gravity. Space-time is not fundamental. Space-time is, if you like, an effective emergent description from something else that underlies it. And what entanglement does is space, quantum erasers do to time. The retrocausality and quantum eraser experiments suggests that, with respect to the observer, the past may only exist after measurement in the present. This is going to be hard for you to believe. Whatever you think, you remember. It's not real. This person you think you are now, it's all a lie. Chapter 3. Measurement versus Observation. Questions posed to modern physics have produced answers of Lovecraftian proportions. Answers that violently and unceremoniously destabilize our frail human sensibilities. However, amidst the surreal landscape, one clue remains. All of these illusions are found to hinge upon the measurement of the observer. But is measurement never the same thing as observation? Is measurement only ever an interaction with an inanimate detector, but never with a conscious mind? From the standpoint of philosophy of mind, it appears obvious that the attributes of mentality are irreducible and therefore fundamental. Thus, it would seem apparent that mentality must exist in the quantum regime if we are to have any hope of avoiding dualism. So Laplace talked about the demon, the demon who knew all about the position of every last atom throughout the universe. In these cases of weak emergence, like the emergence of life from biology, if the demon knew all about the position of every last particle and did incredibly complex computations with his computer mind, he could figure out everything there is to know about life, about metabolism, about the processes that emerge. The difference with strong emergence is you could give Laplace's demon every, all that information about every last atom, every last molecule. Laplace's de demon, still on that basis, could not tell you, could not figure out all the facts about consciousness. Indeed, there would be no reason for him to predict that consciousness should emerge at all. However, proponents of scientism prefer a more Procrustean positivism, ignoring the primary evidence of consciousness. They prefer, instead, to argue that the brain is too large, warm, and wet to make quantum measurements. To get quantum coherence, you need very, very carefully prepared states with no I external interactions at all. And I can't see a, 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 a system that's less uh, like that than, than, than the human brain or the human body. where they're... Chapter 4. Quantum Biology to the Rescue Despite their skepticism, the emerging field of quantum biology has begun to force the critics to eat their words. In recent years, quantum processes have been found to play a role in increasingly large, warm, and wet systems. Zeilinger and his team have since discovered quantum coherence in fullerene and porphyrin molecules, forcing the uncomfortable implications of quantum mechanics back out from under the rug. There's no limit for the validity of quantum mechanics, and uh, we and other groups are actually exploring how far can you go. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that we will go to sizes which will be quite surprising. So in my eyes, uh, this is just temporary. In the future, we will realize quantum phenomena for mm. sufficiently large objects such that it's obvious that quantum mechanics cannot be limited to small uh, particles. And then the philosophical implications will become more relevant because people cannot put them into some corner. These discoveries have not been limited to non-living systems either. In recent years, quantum phenomena have been found in all manner of biological systems. Entanglement has been found to hold together DNA molecules and even play a role in bird migration. Quantum computation has been discovered to aid plants in photosynthesis. 
And lastly, quantum biology has even begun to absorb neuroscience. Gamma synchrony, the best known neural correlate of consciousness, has been discovered to require a quantal explanation. Patients under general anesthesia are unconscious, but if you do evoke potentials or measure EEG, their brains are quite active. We use evoke potentials all the time in spine surgery, and the brain is neurocomputing away in the absence of consciousness. What does disappear only is the gamma synchrony. So here, here we have gamma synchrony, and basically what's happening is that proteins in the front of the brain uh, are oscillating coherently, and proteins in the back of the brain are oscillating coherently. And uh, Walter Freeman and Giuseppe Vitiello, and in a separate paper, Eroy John, concluded that normal neural processes shown here cannot account for this uh, synchrony, and that uh, some quantum effect uh, must be at play in the brain to account for gamma synchrony. Later, in 2010, a nearby bandiopathy discovered topological qubits in microtubules, verifying predictions made by OrcoR theorist Stuart Hameroff. Most interesting, though, are the recent theories of American theoretical biologist Stuart Kaufman. According to Kaufman, the mind exists in a poised realm, hovering just between the quantum and classical activities of the brain, the very point at which quantum measurement occurs. And Feynman famously reconstructed and stated all of quantum mechanics in terms of its famous sum over all <coughs> possible histories <coughs> in quantum mechanics. Something utterly radical, but it, it won't hurt us to think about it. It says the poised realm really is both actual and possible at once. Consciousness is participation in the possible. Chapter 5 the piecing together of dissociated knowledge. Taken in isolation, Kaufman's idea is just another step towards the marriage of quantum mind theory and traditional neuroscience. However, if we take into account the unsettling discoveries of modern physics that both matter and space-time are illusions of quantum measurement, then a stark picture emerges. The wave function of the material brain is collapsed by the immaterial mind that precedes it. As for the neural correlates touted by eliminativists, it appears they were looking through the wrong end of the telescope. If the mind measures the brain, the neural correlates are merely the retrocausal effects of their future observers. In the late 1970s, a neurophysiologist at University of California, San Francisco, named Ben Libet, did some very ex uh, famous experiments. What uh, Libet did was to study patients who were having neurosurgery on their brains, with their brains exposed, while they were awake. They were given a local anesthetic to numb the area of the, of the skull and scalp to access their brains. And they were awake and, and Ben would uh, talk to these people. So for example, what he did was he would stimulate their little finger and look at the part of the sensory cortex on the opposite side that was related to that, record from it electrically, and ask the patient when he or she felt the stimulus on the little finger. And he, he would also stimulate at that particular area of cortex. Now what you would think, would be that if you stimulate the little finger, it takes a finite period of time to get to the opposite side of the cortex, so the patient would report it a fraction of a second later after the stimulus. And when you stimulate it directly, the patient would report it immediately. He found just the opposite. When he stimulated the little finger, the patient felt it immediately, and when he stimulated directly in the cortex, there was a delay. Chapter 6. The Seed of the Soul. But from where does the mind observe itself into space-time? Where does the proverbial seed of the soul reside? In 2002, a pair of Chinese biophysicists, Hu Ping Hu and Mao Xing Wu, first proposed spin-mediated consciousness theory. Their model suggests that quantum spin states are responsible for self-collapse and are the fundamental self-referential pixels of the mind. If correct, and the platonic information behind self-collapse in Penrose's model would be encoded into the spin networks of loop quantum gravity, the very same spin networks from which space-time emerges. It would be most astonishing if science herself were to prove the existence of the soul in a realm underlying physical reality altogether. There's something funny about our conscious experience that seems not to be located within space. That could mean absolutely nothing. It might mean a little something. Or it might be a huge clue. I'm willing to consider the possibility that it's a huge clue. Chapter 7. Epilogue. It should be noted that though the theories of biophysicists like Kaufman, Hu, and Wu are not yet verified, the handwriting is on the wall. Eliminativism has been weighed and measured, and it has been found wanting. We are more than soulless zombies, after all. 
If scientists like Zeilinger are right, and quantum coherence will continue to be found at larger, warmer, and wetter scales, then the implications for neuroscience are staggering. David Auschalam at UC Santa Barbara continues to show more and more warmer and warmer macroscopic quantum state reductions. It appears at the end of the day that the eventual discovery of the soul is no longer a matter of if, but when. The old Cartesian notion of the ghosts in the machine may be dead, not because there is no ghost, but rather because there is no machine. If you liked this video, subscribe. And don't forget to check out my novel, Alaris, The Lances of Light, on Amazon Kindle in the description below.